The primary purpose of Innovative AAC Solutions, the podcast, is to educate and inform. The views expressed during all episodes are solely those of the individuals involved and do not constitute educational or medical advice. They are not necessarily the views of Special School District of St. Louis County. Hi, guys. It's Cheryl Livingston and my good friend. Clara Hayes. And we are happy to welcome you into a new year with Innovative AAC Solutions. Happy New Year to everybody. Did you have a good holiday, Laura? It was good. We were uh, sick, but, you know, it's the nature think, of the beast with two kids. And I, say, I think everybody in the St. Louis area was sick. So, so, but I'm glad you survived and I'm glad you're back. And so we can start this new year off with a bang. Yeah. Speaking of bangs, do you have a fun find for this new 2022? All right. So want you guys to know, well, it's not going to work with my book here. Um, PRC Saltillo for the last three years now have been offering what they call a um, AAC literacy planner. So I've got the paper version here. So if you need a paper version, let us know. We can get that. But what I want you to know is that when we are um, doing our, um, you know, supports that we do throughout the year, I, for the last three years, have decided that I think we should do this on a regular basis. So I'm sharing my screen. I'm taking you to the uh, AAC site that we have here at SSD. And I'm going to go over to implementation. And then there's one here that says learning and teaching AAC teaching resources. I'm going to scroll down then to AAC learning resources for in-person and virtual instruction. So this all started when we um, were virtual in 2020. That's the first year that PRC offered a literacy planner. So what they did was they took a book every single month and they gave us a lesson plan. And then I took that lesson plan and expanded it to have even more support for all kinds of AAC systems. So I want you to see just real quick, um, the fact that you can go back and look at the 2020 literacy planner, everything that was there before, you may wanna go back and revisit or just you know books that you didn't have, uh, didn't use before, you could use now. 2021 was what they called the book club. And what they were looking at there were chapter books. So they were emphasizing that older students maybe would like to choose a book as a group to have a book club. And they had the classics, some of the, you know, best love, best um, well-read books of you know the last few years. So they have those. I did a sample one for this escape from Mr. Limoncello's library. So there's supports for that. But I want you to go and check those out too because you might find a book that your kids would really, really enjoy and you guys could read it together and also then talk about the story. And then I go back to this year now, the 2022 Literacy Planner. So just as of today, I released, put together all the resources. And this time our story is Be Brave Little Penguin. So I want you to know that for all of our kiddos, this is a good story, especially, you know, when we at times that we need to worry about, you know, our kids are struggling and they, they need resources and they need ways to talk through some of their feelings. Well, this little guy, this little penguin is afraid of the water. So we're going to make sure we, you know, talk about what he's feeling and what we could do to help. But also just a note for our older students, there is a lesson plan for amazing ant adventure I'll try to get amazing animal adventure pack. So we're talking about penguins, but we're talking about more about their habitat and, and how they, um, you know, work together. So there's some Tar Heel reader links, there's um, suggestions, things to do, activities to do. So, um, so there's all kinds of good stuff. But again, back to, I wanted to make sure that when you are looking at this lesson plan, if you don't have the book available, I have linked the YouTube videos of people reading the stories aloud. And I have to say, guys, I think every book known to man pretty much has been read and recorded on YouTube. So that's not a problem. So you can watch it, but then you can also go through and sing it. This one lady put it as a song, but then um, I wanted you to have activities to do. I wanted you to have a chance to, um, you know, talk about the vocabulary. So i got smart charts that were in the literacy planner already for LAMP and um, Unity 84, but then I also did them for uh, word power. I did them for, get down here, um, 
the different couple different word power versions. I did it for Proloquo to go. I did it for Snap plus Core or TD Snap, and then I did it for our 63 core board and then the new owner 35 core board. So I'm hoping that it's easy for you just to pull it out, start talking, start going through the activities, start you know having a fun time, and to spread it throughout the month because you know you've got a whole month to talk about this. And it will be fun and maybe, you know, divide it up so that others that are, um, you know, taking your kids as far as your opportunities for the kids to work on it, they could have different things that they do in different times. So um, it's something that would be good for um, all kinds of, for good reasons, I hope. And so Cheryl, um, can you tell the listeners too, just, is it, is it just like a one and done with, with this, as far as the literacy where they read the book and, and then they're done and they use the smart charts and then they're done? No, it's supposed to be, and again, the lesson plan, they actually have activities for you to do. There's, you know, like on this one, we're going to make some sensory things and, and talk about, you know, what's going on with the penguins. Um, no, I think, and my theory about literacy is our kids like to hear stories a few times. So you can break it down into maybe one time we just read it. And then the next time we read it and we talk about one section of it, and then we read it again and we talk about a different section. So no, it, it's meant to be a multi process, multi-step, multi, multi uh, involved process, because of the fact that the more the kids are hearing it, the more they're relating to it, the more they're going to share. And that will give them a chance to feel comfortable about the information and, and, and kind of bring up more about what they're how they, how can, how they can associate what they're feeling with what the pink one's feeling. So no, it, it's meant to be a month long. I love that you mentioned that there's some sensory activities with it. So, you know, if we're doing a science lesson, we could carry it over to science and we could carry, it sounds like we could carry it over to other oh, yeah. lessons like math and math, right? even some and social then- studies concepts. And, and it's going to relate to the weather. It's cold outside. So these penguins, <laughs> that's what their habitat is. So we can talk about how, how it, what it feels like and what, what ice, you know, they're standing on ice cubes. Well, what does that feel like? So yeah, no, you're right. Lots of different ways. And then it's not just this month, right? We, we have right. extra so then, resources be, for this month, but where, where would right. they go back to find February's? So when, so when I get February together, um, and also should, I should say this, whole year for the, the planner it's animal talk so every story has something to do with animals and they are geared towards younger kids as far as the books go but I don't want us to defer from the fact that that sometimes makes the stories easier for our oh, even our older students to um, have a chance to process that information it's, we're not trying to overwhelm them with too much um, literature so um, the next month they'll go back to the AAC site And if you um, need help getting there, but a lot of times, I think all of us, I know my, when I do an email, the bottom of my email has a link to to the site. So you just go back to our site and then on that um, section with the implementation ideas and uh, strategies, you click on that and then that'll take you to the 2022 planner. And then I'll post the one for February. Perfect. I think that's a a great resource that sounds like it's already kind of created. And again, if you, if you're out for a period of time, knowing that sickness is going around, if you're out, it's an easy one to hand over to a sub as a sub planner. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think a lot of people will, it's a really good fun find. I think that we're starting the year off with a bang for sure. And also share it with families. Um, Definitely the, you know, just listening to the story can be um, I don't know. I, I, again, I love snuggling up and reading storybooks together. So even if the book isn't something you could hand to somebody, giving them that link and they can listen to it and um, you can pause a video at any time and talk about it. So yeah, it's, it could be a, a multifaceted uh, kind of ex- extension of, you know, stuff you're doing at school, but I hope the kids perceive it as fun and I hope they perceive it as something that they can share, you know, information and share what they're learning with others. And I think you make a good point about as far as it's geared towards younger students, it it could be, but you know, when we think about age respectful things, lots of students are interested in animals and animals Mm -hmm. are really motivating, talking about Mm -hmm. their habitats, talking about the zoo, talking about all these things, um, I think is ageless. Um, I know I still love learning about animals, you, Mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those shared bonds I have with my son. So, um, 
even though the drawings might be geared towards younger individuals, I do think, you know, being age respectful versus age appropriate. And I don't Ashley Laracy coined that term um, and just thinking about age respectful things like do our students, are they motivated by animals? Let's, mm -hmm. if so, let's mm -hmm. explore this together. Um, yeah. Okay, quickly, before we jump into our interview today, I wanted to share a quick fun find that I had, and that is out of DTA um, with Vicki Clark, who, if I could be a person, Cheryl, I think I would want to be <laughs> Vicki Clark. Um, she is yeah, just She's so on my list too, yeah. She's so inspirational, and so she has a ton of resources out of Dynamic Therapy Associates. So these come out of there. She has made um, one of them is a packet, and the other one is a, a freebie for a short time. And there are two really great resources I just quickly wanted to share. <clears throat> so the first is this AAC Classroom Communication Project. Um, this is available on their website for download. If you go to Dynamic therapy, let me find it. It's mydynamictherapy.com and you go to their store, you'll find some of these downloads there. Um, but one of the downloads is the AAC Classroom Communication Project. And I like this find because it has tons of resources. So if you were sharing this with a parent, there's already references, but it breaks down learning tools and um, kind of progress monitoring tools so that you can track um, percentage wise, where your student might be kind of at as far as their communication skills. So what percentage of their wants and needs are pre-symbolic, um, social exchanges, what's pre-symbolic, what, uh, what does their language development look like? And then it moves up through, um, through that progression. So pre-symbolic to symbolic to early language to language development and kind of breaks it down and it describes each level, um, it's not meant to be something that's an assessment. It's most, it's meant to be like a guide and a learning tool to kind of see how far they've gotten in a specific amount of time. So I really, really like that because again, some of our students, maybe we're, we're focusing on this big goal, a uh, lofty goal, sometimes of sentence level mastery of wants and needs, but maybe we need to do a little small stepping stone of orientation or um, indication of a choice with when two objects, objects are available, things like that. Um, so I like how it breaks down. That's mm -hmm. the first yeah. one. And then the second one is a freebie and I don't know how long this will be free. So definitely go there and scoop it up, but it is called the homeschool, homeschool wordless bundle. And I feel like we, at least once or twice a semester, we get asked, well, they don't have any reinforcers or motivators, or they're not using it at home. Um, this is a really great implementation sheet that you can share with family so that they're involved, as well as at school, or if you're trying to get gen ed buy-in, um, these are just different planning sheets that you can use as a team to kind of decide what specific vocabulary do we need to make sure that they have access to, as well as maybe even program in their system. Like today, I was just out dropping off a device and ranch dressing, like I would never have guessed this, but ranch dressing <laughs> needed to be on the forefront of the food page. Like it was not in the system. Surprisingly, I thought it would have been under condiments. It was not. But and this, yeah, but that's it was, specific. Yeah. yeah. It was this okay. kid's jam. Wow. So, so it's just kind of this guiding tool um, helps kind of identify some of these things for our students and um, helps us personalize it so we can meet yeah. their needs. I love when they, anytime you can hand somebody something that's got at least a few things on it, it gets you thinking. I think when we go in and we'll say, well, what is he like? It's too broad. It's too vague. But when you start breaking it down, then like you said, <laughs> food wise, not just dressing, but ranch dressing and all day, every day. It's not just on my salad. It's on my French fries. It's on my... <laughs> Maybe by so itself. Yeah. I mean, oh, I don't, yeah. I don't okay. Know. He, he really, I can't, I can't say I'm that big a fan, but I do like ranch dressing yep. and, it, and it seems like more and more recipes call for the mix, you know, the powder, you add it to different entrees more so now. So yes, I can see where maybe that should be on everybody's device. I never thought about it. Yeah. So, um, like I said, there's one for home and for school, so it can definitely be used across settings. Mm -hmm. So we'll link these in the show notes. Good. Yeah, those are great. As far as show notes All go, right. Cheryl, I got a, I got, I thought I would start us off with a bang. 
I have the wonderful Kate McLaughlin and uh, she, most people know her better known as the AAC coach. She is a wonderful SLP with tons of AAC knowledge and What's it been now? Two years since I think she started well, sharing resources. I was going to say, I, I again, we've gone through quite a bit of time where we were, you know, looking for support virtually. She stepped up. I, I that's my first recollection of when we became familiar with her was during that time, and she stepped up and really, really gave all kinds of information, all kinds of graphics. I, lo- I lo- love, I don't, did, did you ask her who her artist is? Because she's, she does a, the beautiful job of something that captures your attention, but it's not so busy or it's not so um, hard to figure out. It's just, I love the way she does it. So um, she, I think, I'm going to say that if, if she hadn't already started, she started right at the beginning of when we were shutting down. So she definitely has been about two years. Yeah. And so I had the pleasure of sitting down with her and talking about just this whole idea of emergent communication and what we need to be doing to support our early emergent communicators so that they were setting them up for success for the long haul. So um, it's a good one. So sit back and listen to our interview with Kate McLaughlin. Guys, welcome back to Innovative AAC Solutions. I cannot even tell you how excited I am for our interview week here today. Kate, welcome. Um, We are so excited to have you. Hi, Laura. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Do you, I mean, do you basically just go by Kate or do you go by the AAC coach now? (laughs) (laughs) I go by Kate. (laughs) (laughs) Are you, I I kind of wondered, I'm like, you know, because the AAC coach is on all of these, these posts, is it something where you're like, oh, I wish I would have picked something different. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, you know, I don't know if you, I'm not great at picking that kind of stuff, <laughs> but it, you know, I was looking for something that didn't feel too academic. Um, and, and so we went with the AAC coach after a lot of back and forth, but yeah. So tell our listeners a little bit about, I, I've heard you talk about it. I know your sister had some, had some involvement, right. With the, how you developed the AAC coach. Oh no, not Oh, my. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so she, she kind of helped with some of that. Right. But then just tell our listeners a little bit about your background and, and kind of any, any little tidbits that we would it would be helpful to know. So um, I'm a speech language pathologist um, specializing in AAC. Um, I practice in Connecticut. I'm in private practice working with uh, families and school districts, um, doing evaluations, that sort of thing. I um, and and then I'm online quite a bit um, doing um, providing just resources, free resources to to families and professionals around uh, AAC implementation. And then I recently have um, launched a course on AAC implementation through uh, Learn, Play, Thrive. Awesome. So am I, am I wrong in thinking it was your sister, your sister has a marketing background? Is that, am I making this up? Uh, no, I, I, no, you're not making it up. I, I wasn't sure where you're going with it. Yeah. So my sister is, uh, she has a design background and she has some marketing experience. And so she's been a wonderful resource uh, to kind of point me in a good direction I mean, because those things do not come uh, easily to me at all <laughs> and they come easily to her. So yeah, she's been invaluable. Gotcha. Um, and so for those of you who need a quick catch up, so um, I was kind of joking earlier, Kate, the other, the other thing that you're known by is the AAC coach, because you do have um, a lot of resources out there on different social media platforms that have great information and is coined by the AAC coach, um, with your graphics and all of that. And I think they're so helpful because they're easy to kind of understand and they're simple and they catch the eye. And I think that there's something that a lot of people have learned from, and I think probably given you a lot of good feedback on. Yeah. And that's really the, um, that's really the hope, right? Kind of like you in this podcast is providing digestible chunks of information that people don't feel overwhelmed because so much information that's out there is really academic or a lot of information all at once or in a really long form. And I think uh, a lot of times people learn better if it kind of uh, trickles in over time. So uh, kind of same idea. So Really what I wanted to kind of dive into today, because there's a lot of different topics with, with all your resources you've given so far. What I wanted to dive into is just this idea of authentic communication and what 
what it looks like for early communicators, emergent communicators. What's your background with that? What have you historically seen and what are you seeing, you know, in the here and the now with our er emergent communicators? Right. So, um, a lot of the work that I do is with emergent communicators or, um, or communicators with really complex bodies. And I think that um, part of my interest in this it comes from a feeling that as a field, we've gotten really, really focused on the technology and the language and teaching that. But sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the AAC is just one piece of communication. So I think for our um, our emergent communicators, really all AAC uh, users, we're really thinking about communication as multimodal and using all strategies to express yourself. And I think that's particularly important for our emergent AAC learners that we're not so heavily focused. Obviously, we want to be modeling on the device. That's critical for learning. But we don't want to be uh, expecting too much from them through the device early on. So we really have to be thinking about how are they communicating now? Um, how are we going to show them how the device adds to the skills that they already have or what they're already able to communicate and how it's not extra work for them. It's something that augments that. And I think also even uh, for our learners with really complex bodies, even for whom may not be emergent, um, an understanding of what multimodal communication looks like is also really important because AUC can be uh, very um fatiguing or the amount of effort it takes individuals with complex bodies. And so it's smart for them to use more than just their AUC to express themselves. It's how that they can be as efficient as possible and save their energy for other things that are really important too. Yes, absolutely. What would you say to someone who um, feels like there needs to be some scaffolding or some stepping stones to, to access? And what does that look like for emergent communicators versus someone who you're like, oh, we know that their receptive language is high and we know that they, um, they need a robust communication system. What would, what would your response be to that? Well, I think everybody needs a robust AC system, first and foremost. Um, I, I think that when we, whenever we're planning for uh, language development, we have to be looking at the long term um, and making decisions based on that long term so that we can um, be, you know, getting the right uh, tools and skills in place. But I do think that there is a place for uh, modeling a robust system while individuals work on developing their access skills. So just because a learner isn't able to point yet or isn't able to use switches yet, that doesn't mean that we're not giving them AAC. We want to be giving them AAC because the AAC is actually the language, which takes a long time to learn. And if we hold, uh, hold off uh, implementing until they are demonstrating um, a physical ability, uh, we're really just uh, wasting time, quite honestly. And the other piece to that is um, kids get ready when we uh, we offer an opportunity. And, and so by offering AEC, they may see more of a reason to work on those skills. Um, for some kids, though, um, I really recommend implementing through modeling and then doing working on point for uh, in other contexts. Um, it's that parallel uh, learning um, that uh, Linda Burkhart talks a lot about around developing access skills in one context and uh, doing the language work in, in another way um, so that down the line, those two things can come together in a, you know using a full language system. Love that. And I love the reference to Linda. We just had a um, switch class talking about her stepping stones too, and, and how we can use it as a, as a resource, but not necessarily as a, as a cookbook, as we like to call it, because so it's so messy, emergent communication, right? Um, I've got an eight month old at home and, you know, I, do I think that she has some words? Yes, I do. Will she do them on command? No, she won't. Um, <laughs> they never do because you know, language in general is messy, um, but we, I think we forget or we think that individuals need to prove themselves before they can take the next step. Um, and so I feel like those are good reminders just to make sure that everyone understands that just because it's never going to be hundred percent accurate, like sometimes it's not even going to be 80% accurate, but it doesn't mean we don't give them access to the next, the next point. Um, so they yeah, can and the more it. complex the body, the less likelihood they're going to be consistent in any way. And that's okay. And that's expected. And um, it's really about creating an environment where AAC is a language that's spoken. And um, of course, we need to also, I just 
just to add, when we are selecting whatever that robust language system is going to be, we want to make sure that it offers a way to access it efficiently using whatever access method we think a learner is going to be able to um, develop skills for. So there are some systems that are wonderful direct for deluxe direct selector, but are cumbersome. And so the systems that aren't designed with scanning in mind um, may be cumbersome for a, a switch user and um, may be not as efficient as they could be with a system that is designed for scanners. So when, when we do that, I like to look to systems that are as flexible as possible for meeting the needs of um, many learners. So if, if a staff was listening to this and they said, well, you know, I don't know where my communicator might fall, what would be some things you might see characteristics that um, would qualify someone as, as kind of an emergent communicator? So we think about emergent communicators, emergent communicators are anyone regardless of age who does not yet have a consistent, reliable means of um, symbolic expression. So they don't have a way to communicate using words or signs um, or text that they can that they can rely on to express themselves. So really it covers a wide range of ages and a wide range of learners. Um, but it's also really important to know that emergent doesn't mean cognitive impairment. It doesn't mean and um, that a, a learner is more substantially impacted internally than uh, than another, you know, another child. We don't really know that until they develop that uh, consistent means of expression expression. So it's so, so important that um, we're providing lots and lots of opportunities for language access and learning, regardless of uh, the fact that our learner is, is still emergent. Mm -hmm. What about strategies? So if you said, oh, I definitely have somebody that I can relate this to, what would be some strategies or you know, places to start, tips, tricks, little gems of wisdom you might have? Right. So uh, Assuming a, a, a robust system has been selected and made available, I really look to what is the learner interested in at following their lead, um, talking about what they're interested in or paying attention to, um, noticing their um, nonverbal communication, so things that are not symbolic, not language, um, be it gestures, body language, facial expressions, um, and verbally referencing those um, th that communication. And by that, I mean saying what you see. I see you going to the door and then telling them what that means to you. Oh, that makes me think you want to go out and then modeling that message on um, on the AAC system so that they're seeing your communication is successful, I'm understanding you, and here's some language that you could use to express that if I didn't understand or, you know, or if somebody else didn't understand what that meant to you. So I, I think that that um, following their lead and being really responsive to their communication and modeling what they're expressing is really um, my, my go-to. Yeah, acknowledgement and then shaping, yeah. And what I love that you said too, is just the piece of authenticity of following their lead. So, um, <laughs> uh, following their lead versus just kind of sit and get compliance based activities, I think can, can take you so many places like <laughs> versus, um, you know, forcing around, forcing a square peg in a round hole, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, interesting that you say compliance because, we, you know, so much of what we want for our AAC learners is to be able to communicate whatever they're thinking. And then we come in with all these compliance-based teaching strategies, telling them what to do and when, and they have to follow our lead. Well, the problem with that is we don't know what they actually want to say. It has to come from them. So our intervention has to follow them if we want that. As, and that's why I say it, it's so important to have that long-term vision. If we want um, long-term for the communication to come from them, we have to be focusing on that from the very, very beginning. And you recently did a, a free webinar that was so great. And one of the things you talked about was prompting and the problem with prompting and it kind of hits on the same idea of, of when we prompt, we assume we know what they want to say and we interrupt their train of thought. There were so many other, other points. Do you want to speak a little more to that too? Cause I think that's a really good. Yeah. And I think, so when, when we prompt, um, there is a, an implication that we have a target in mind. 
right? And and so if we're still, we don't know what a learner wants to say. Even um, those of us who know a learner really, really well, I, Gail Porter says, um, would you let your mother speak for you? <laughs> Which I think, you know, as a mom, I think I know my kids really well. Would I let my own mother talk for me? No, she knows me well, but God, I'd never let her speak for me, right? And, and so even for those of us who know uh, learners really, really well, we still don't know exactly what they would say. We might be able to guess, and sometimes we're right and wrong. <laughs> and so what we want to be doing is noticing what they're communicating authentically and, and getting in there with them. If we're prompting for a specific word, what we're really telling them is uh, your internal thought is not important to me. And your job right now is to say the things I want you to say. And again, that gets totally away from where we're hoping to go with the AAC. And it's not a situation where a learner can learn like that and then switch to uh, communicating their own message. It just doesn't work like that. They have to be from the get-go um, expressing their own messages. And I think a lot of times when I talk to people about this, they say, that's great, but my learner's not communicating anything. And I think while it, you know, it, that, that may feel true, often learners are communicating. It just may be very, very nuanced. It be, may be very, very individual to them. Uh, and for those with really complex bodies, they may not have a way. And then we need to get in there and help them find a way um, to express themselves. But everybody's always communicating. Uh, um, it just may be more obvious uh, and more uh, clear for some than others. Yeah. And I always tell people the, the complex body like that whole, that adds a whole another level and layer to this because when the only control you have is not to do anything like that's a message in of itself right and we should be honoring that versus forcing um we, in in switch class we call it the the dead man's goal i think we um uh Oh gosh, we coined that from Jane um, Corston because if you can pick up a hand and do it without consent or without, you know, a piece of learning, then is it really a goal that we need to be having? No, like we want them to access the switch and communicate when they want the consequence and they want to say something. And when they don't, we want to honor that as well. Like we expect them not to hit the switch and we expect them not to say something. Um, so I think. All of those things I think are, are things to, to kind of keep in mind. Are there any, are there any data um, assessment tools or collection tools or even assessments that you like for someone kind of starting off as an emergent communicator? Yeah, my favorite assessment is the pragmatics profile for ACE users, and that's my go-to. Um, I think that it's a great one to be doing um, like triennial evaluations um, because it really just describes the learner's communication across a lot of different contexts and however they're expressing it now or they're not expressing it, and that's totally fine. I think for uh, our most emergent or our most complex uh, kids, we, we want to paint a really good picture of where they are right now. We, you know, how are they communicating? Um, because they may be communicating one way at home that school's not aware of and vice versa. And, and so that can grow everybody's knowledge about the ways that they can communicate. And it allows us to look back um, over time and say, oh, yeah, I remember that they were, they were doing it that way three years ago or whatever. Um, so that, that's really my go-to. There are, there are others, but I, I find that that one is the most authentic in its description of a learner. And I like that one too, because I think if there is a discrepancy between the environments that, yeah, you can, you can say, well, why is there a discrepancy? Maybe there's something there that we haven't, you know, hit on that we could pull in or carry over. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, great one. Any challenges you see, it's, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but any challenges you see when working with emergent communicators, what do you wish we could change or what pitfalls do you kind of run into? You know, I think that, um, a couple. One is that long-term vision. I, I think that it's so hard, um, you know, as somebody who's worked with lots of emergent communicators, lots of emergent communicators with really complex bodies, I know what's what's possible. And so it's easy for me to come in and say, yeah, you got to get a robust system in. Yeah, we got to do this work and that work. And as sometimes people look at me like <laughs> heads because they're thinking, are you, you're not even looking at the kid who's in front of you. But I have that experience of working with a lot of kids over a long period of time to say, no, I know kids like this. And I know that they're conversational now after so many years of work. So I think it can be so, so hard. It is a bit of a leap of faith um, with 
uh, really emerging communicators and, and the more complex, but it's such an important one um, to, to, uh, to really trust the process and, and know that it's not a, uh, you know, we may, we didn't avail the decisions done. This is where we're going. It can shift over time to, as we learn more about the learner, but it's having that long-term goal and finding the path to get there and keeping that long-term goal in mind and knowing that it's possible. I just had this happen this week where I went out to an elementary school and it was actually someone that um, we've, we've kind of been talking about as far as Gestalt language processing, because there, there's some of that there. And the team is like, he's just not ready. He doesn't, we, he won't, he won't touch a device. He doesn't understand what the device is for. And I said, do you remember? So she was a, she did transfer from a, dis- a different district and she was at a um, middle school. And I said, do you remember the student that we worked with? I said, when he was in elementary school about this other student's new student's age, everybody thought all he could do was a big Mac. And I said, no, 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 we're going to give him access to something. And we did. And it took him four years and he is independent. Like, and, and this, and this teacher knew him and she was like, Oh, like you think he could be this, the same. And I was like, absolutely. Like it's the same kid and not the same. Every kid is individualized, but we, you and I have seen the power of just sticking with it and knowing that if you just can just keep on persevering, they will get there. It just takes a yeah, long time. It's, yeah. And it's so hard in those situations. Once a kid has gotten to that point, people will look at them and think that they're somehow fundamentally different than the emergent communicator that's in front of you. And in fact, they're not. They've just been given the tools and the opportunities and the teaching um, to get there because kids, again, kids don't get ready until they have an opportunity. And the truth of the matter is teams don't get ready until they have an opportunity to do the work. Um, and so it's it's a process for everybody, but it's such an important um, process to engage in um, and not be uh, gatekeeping. Yes, 100%. And I wish there was a way, you know, there's so much red tape involved, but you having these case studies, having these resources of saying like, here's where the student started and here is, is where they are at now. Um, and I still feel like, you know, the last 10 years we've come a long way in AAC, but I think we have a long way to go and in, in kind of developing that and shaping that mindset. Like you said, any other, you mentioned a few, any other pitfalls um, that you've seen? I think, you know, a lot of it goes back to, to that piece a lot, you know, it pitfalls. Um, I think it, the other thing that comes to mind, and I don't know, um, is an understanding uh, of kind of the interactive nature of communication and AAC use. I think when teams start implementing AAC, they think about it. And I think I said this the other day when we were talking, they they think about it as um, teaching them the language, they put it in the the message bar and they play it. And, And really AAC development or use is is a back and forth interaction. They say one thing, we say something back to help them expand it, they expand. And so the development is a lot messier and a lot less straightforward than we might expect it to be. And it's so important to just know that and be comfortable with it and not think that it has to look a certain way for it to be right. <laughs> it has to, it's that, it's the engaging in that back and forth interaction with the learner that um, is, is really where the, you know, the magic happens as it were. But um, so so yeah, thinking about all of this more from an interactive, conversational, enjoy our time together place, uh, you know, respecting multimodal communication and, you know, sprinkling in the AAC and lots of modeling. So I, you know, I think for me, I say pitfalls, it comes back to uh, education and what we need to do to help people understand what does it actually look like? Because what people think it looks like isn't always or often isn't the case, right? It's not, there's no formula to this. Um, it's not about discrete teaching. It's about interacting and, and having a conversation. Yeah, it's not just showing what you know, as I like to say, um, or as Rachel Madel always says, inspire, don't require. And, and you know, these little catchphrases, they're, they're kind of handy to keep in, the, in your back pocket because it's true. Um, before you can show what you know, you have to value just the form of communication. You have to value interacting with other people and that, that can be messy. Um, the, 
Oh, the, the other thing I kind of wanted to hit on and come back to is this idea that we were talking about prompting earlier. Are there any, um, strategies or things, your go-tos for helping that initiation piece? Because so often we especially with emerging communicators, I feel like we find ourselves in this trap of like, I, I say something, you, you answer, I say something, you answer. And then, and then of course these individuals become res- respondent and, Yeah. Um, So we have to, um, initiation has to come from them, but we can teach it, right? Um, So we can um, really explicitly model it. Um, I uh, use, and this is something that I learned from Gail Porter and Linda Burkhart, I use that, I have something to say, ooh, ooh, I have something to say, and really highlighting for a learner. Um, Now I have something to say, so I'm going to the device, I'm going to say something on the device. So I embed that into my models just to highlight that initiation step for them. Um, And then um, using that language when we notice that they have something to say. So rather than prompting them to say something, I say, oh man, you look like a person with something to say, or it looks like you have something to say. Um, because over time, if they've kind of learned that when people have something to say, they go to that 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 device, um, that can be really helpful. And the other thing, particularly for, uh, and I, I should say, I also use that verbal referencing technique of, oh, I have something to say, I'm going to the device to say exactly what I'm doing, or oh, I have something to say, I'm touching the, the book to let you know I have something to say. Um, and for our learners with most complex bodies, we might need to teach them a movement to let people know they have something to say if the, is, if the device isn't immediately accessible or if they're a partner-assisted scanner. So, um, you know, if that's raising their hand when they have something to say or using their voice when they have something to say, um, um, that's something that I do uh, explicit practice on. Let's let's practice how you let somebody know uh, you have something to say. We do. Uh, there's techniques that go in, you know, happen there, but specifically helping them learn to use those movements um, and modeling them again for ourselves. Love it. And um, any listener that's in the district that would want access, we do have some, I have something to say bracelets. So reach out to your facilitator and we can, we can talk through some more strategies there. Cause I love those ideas. Thanks, Kate. Um, what would be some good strategies if you, if, if, you know, a listener is, is like, yeah, I have an emerging communicator. I'm doing all the things that you've said, Kate, like I, but I'm still stuck. Like they're struggling. What, what would be some good strategies or supports for someone who isn't making steady gains in that area or struggling with what's in place? So if we're doing all the right stuff, right? And so it's, it's worth taking an inventory of yourself to say, am I doing all those things? But if we're doing all those things and we're still not seeing progress or the gains that we expect, I think we need to stop and reflect on why that may be. So there may be something about this learner that we're not recognizing that we need to support better. And I've seen that, I know you and I've been talking about Gestalt language processing is one of those reasons. I've seen it for learners with uh, cortical visual impairment or you know some other reason, uh, be it a motor skill that we haven't addressed. There, there's probably some gap there that we are not supporting the learner best yet. <laughs> and so it becomes a kind of a, um, a search to figure out what that is and what the strategies are. You know, I've met learners who um, were throwing their system across the room until we realized they had cortical visual impairment. And so they couldn't see what was happening on that device. And it just felt scary. People kept pushing it in their face. Um, And and so, but by switching some of the way we were presenting the device, uh, switching how the visuals looked, um, they were able to process that visually a little bit better or, you know, do it auditorily. And then they were able to make gains with their system. So it comes back to troubleshooting and thinking really creatively and getting curious about the learner. And then also know um, if you're doing all the right stuff and you uh, are thinking through all of these trying to it, sometimes it just takes time <laughs> and that's okay. You know, um, I have seen learners where it's been modeled for a year before they say something and that's okay. That's, I mean, during that year, you bet we're thinking about all the reasons why not and trying to problem solve, but for some learners, it just does take a lot of time and that's okay. Um, again, we're on this for the long haul. So we don't give up. We, we try and tweak to make it more effective. Yeah. And, and that puts the onus back on us as, as implementation partners and trying to do the detective work and try to think creatively outside the box and not say, well, the system isn't working for them. Let's just 
throw it out. Let's do something different um, and focus on the technology. It really comes back to to us and, and them. Um, okay, so before I let you go, I always ask everyone who comes on the podcast, what is your favorite AAC moment to date? Um, date? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I'll have to think about that one. I, I you know, um, actually, what, one thing that happened recently um, that just made me so super proud. Um, I have a learner. Uh, she is 16 now, and um, she has been working so, so hard. She's one of those uh, learners who was like such complex body, had very little movement uh, when she was younger. Um, and we got her on a partner assisted scanning system. We started working on switches. I mean, she's been on this now for eight years, this journey. And so she's conversational, but she still has a really complex body and has to work really hard for her communication. So when she does say something, it's because she, it's important to her to say it. Uh, and so she had a, a new classmate join her who also has complex communication needs and they're in different classes. There's inclusion happening, but they, they have a, 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 during the day they often interact and, and he, um, he is, uh, in the process of figuring out AAC with his team. And she used her AAC and I can't, I wish I could recall exactly what she said, but basically the gist of the message was she was advising him to pretend like he was sick so that he would be sent home. <laughs> and so she was, you know, she was conspiring with him, which is so funny because I wasn't, you know, she, she she made this message with me and we wrote it down and I promised that he would get it, but I wasn't allowed to tell <laughs> the teachers because she, you know, she wanted to protect that message. Obviously <laughs> she wanted him to get away with it. And then the next day he did try, <laughs> which was, I just thought was so fabulous because it was just so like, these are kids being kids and wow, how far she has come that her skills allow her to do that. And, um, she, you know, it was, it was worth it to her. And that, again, going back to like, we don't know what they want to say. None of us would have, uh, thought that that was her message on that day. So, um, it just, it's just really funny and fun. Oh my gosh. That makes me, that brings me such a joy because it is like, it's just kids being kids. And mm -hmm. like you said, it, it's her message. It's what she, you would have never guessed. Yeah. I love yeah. it. And it's, it's so authentic. Right. And I know that that's kind of, you know, what you're hoping to spread with your new course through learn, play, thrive. Um, can you tell the listeners if they want more information, if they want to listen to you, like I love listening to you, if they want to listen to you some more, what does, where would they get access to that course? Yes. You get to listen to me for many, many contact hours <laughs> in the course. So the course is available through learn, play, thrive. You can get access to, uh, the information through my website or through learn, play thrives or my social media accounts. Um, it is, uh, a course that's offered for ASHA CEUs and AOTA CEUs. Um, and it covers um, everything from just background, things you need to know about AAC to assessment and implementation and, and some information about implementing in schools. So it's a, it's a big course, <laughs> not gonna lie, but there, it's jam packed with lots of information and videos, which I think um, a lot of people just wanna see some of this in action. So there are videos in there, um, both videos of me working with clients and videos of uh, animated videos that I've created to kind of highlight techniques. Perfect. Um, so we will share your website and social media information in the show notes, but if um, anybody has a specific question, what's the best way to reach out to you? Um, definitely the, the social media, um, through my website, you can also, uh, get me. So it's at, at the AAC coach on Instagram or AAC coach on, uh, Facebook. Um, I tell people ahead of time, don't wait, feel free to, uh, send more than one message because I do get a lot, but I, I do try and keep up on them. Um, and then, um, on my website, the AACcoach.com, there's, there's contact information as well. Perfect. Kate, thanks so much for being on. This was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure um, to have your, your insight and um, your thoughts and ideas. So thank you so much. And um, we will, we will share some more resources guys um, for innovative AAC solutions. We just want to thank Kate, the AAC coach. Be sure to check her out. Thanks.
So for our innovative resource this week, we wanted to highlight the AAC Coach website as well as her authentic AAC course. If you go to theaaccoach.com, you'll see that Kate has a ton of resources under her free downloads as well as just her overall overview of her services. When we go to free downloads, you can see that she has a link to all of her files on Google Drive and then also highlights each of those posts that she has created on social media so that you can easily download them. If we go into Google Drive, you can see that they're also downloaded in different languages including Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French, English, and Dutch. And then once you go into the file you need, she has both activity and topics. For example, if we wanted to model with Play-Doh, here are some active here are some different um, resources as far as target vocabulary for different pragmatic functions. And informational handouts, these are great for staff and just kind of having as reference, such as a think aloud as we mentioned in the interview or verbal referencing, and she has them both in black and white for easy printing or in color. So definitely take a look at those resources. If we go back to the website itself, you can see that there is a link to her authentic AAC course as well, um, and registration information available there, including the ASHA CEO information and um, the availability for topic-paced, self-paced instruction. Hi guys, it's Cheryl. I wanted to take a minute to show you some products that we checked out from the IRC. This first one is called the 3D Feel and Find. Well, the reason I chose this one for today's interview was we were emphasizing working with emergent communicators and students with complex bodies. And I want to make sure throughout their day, the students have a chance to work on textures, shapes, dexterity. Uh, we talked about access is huge for success with a communication system. Well, the more a student has opportunities to practice manipulating things or finding things or um, differentiating between what this feels like versus what that feels like. It'll be helpful. And we also mentioned in the interview that there's working on language, but then there's also working on other skills. So this is one of those other skills that could be easily done you know, in the classroom. What we, I consider a five minute filler, you know, we could just work on it for a few minutes. It's not meant to be a, a major task, but it could be fun, it could be rewarding, it could be something that the, the student would enjoy doing in their, um, maybe their leisure time. So what it is, is it's plates, wooden plates that are cut out for the shapes. There's a little bit of a rough texture. It's at, um, oh, I wanna say like, oh, cortical, car, cortical board, something. <laughs> it's got, yeah, just a little bit of texture that um, you would find the shape to go with it. So if we hand the student the shape, then I'm looking for them to explore, ex experiment with kind of, well, what does it feel like? If vision isn't supporting them, then all they maybe have to provide input is touch. So, you know, the fact that there's long sides and short sides and corners, you can give them vocabulary to go along with that. And all the textures are same as far as smooth goes. There's not rough or bumpy, but um, it's more about the, what it feels like um, the dimensions of it. So we could have, you know, just pretty easy right in, you know, it, one shape, one tile to match it to. Or you might start expanding to uh, two different kinds of shapes and then let them check them both out and see, you know, which one they think would go with it. All kinds of different things. There's some what shapes that look more like letters. There's shapes that look more like animals shapes that look like people. Um, so, you know, it's, it's fun. It's meant to be learning, but having fun at the same time. And it's something that you could, you know, do a, a variety of different things. The bag that comes with it, 
holds all your shapes. Oops, knock it over. Um, but we can make that a grab bag where they reach in and try to find or see what they get, you know, the excitement of, of the unknown. And then there's all kinds of tiles in the box. So definitely consider that for students that you're working on those skills. And another one is a puzzle. This one is, uh, again, from the IRC. It's a Melissa and Doug, which we, you know, a lot of us in our homes have a lot of Melissa and Doug products. So um, something familiar, but yet this one's taking it to the next level, uh, opening things, manipulating different kinds of hardware. It should be something that they can explore. It should be something that um, will give them a chance to practice, but in a way that would be engaging. So we've got everything from opening the back of the car, the van here by turning the key. Okay, we've got, I guess this would be considered more of a, a hinge lock gate that we're opening. Then we have some combination locks too. So um, this one with the dial and then one over here with the multiple numbers, just FYI on the back, it tells you what the combinations are. So I'm not gonna say it out loud in case the kids are listening, but um, you could work on, you know, finding those. So this may be for older students with ooh, a little more practice with using their touch to find and explore things, but I think it's fun. I think it's something that they would enjoy feeling. And then if you make a big deal about something opening, um, that would be very rewarding. So again, Check out the IRC, lots of good stuff. Uh, I wish I had more time. Like I, I wish yeah, this was yeah. like an eight part series where we could just do yeah. hours of time talking to Kate because she's just got so much in there that you know that she could share. Well, and for those of you that can take advantage of her course, you know, I'm sure that's what that will be is just lots and lots of time listening and learning. Um, but yeah, and I, I love her demeanor. She's just real laid back. And I love her way of thinking about our kids. When she was talking about, again, look long term, I think that's something that we all need to remind ourselves because we get kind of distracted by the immediate and the the bells and whistles, but um, she definitely made me remember that I need to always be looking big, but we need to step through the process, not just run through it. Definitely. So, um, you know, enjoy, we hope you enjoyed the resources, some examples of those resources on her website. I, she's constantly, um, at least once a month, I feel like she's, she's got a new graphic mm -hmm. and resource mm -hmm. that's easy to digest. Mm -hmm for mm -hmm. staff, for families. So um, also follow her on social media and Facebook. Her, she's got a Facebook page as well as her Instagram, the mm -hmm. AAC coach. And um, it hope we hope you enjoyed this, this latest episode. It's, I can't believe it's 2022 and we're starting this year off. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. I and mean, like I said, there's, there's good things out there. So we want to make sure you take advantage of it. Make sure you uh, take some time to learn because I know you're busy, but learning is something that will make you feel, I think, better about your situation when you've got strategies and you've got materials, you've got resources. I was going to say, and I, some of the most successful people out there, I know one of the biggest um, similarities between all of those individuals is that they're constantly striving to be better. And that idea of self-starters and, and being better, always searching for more and grow, searching for growth is really important. So as we start our new years off uh, with these resolutions and things that might fade away, just constantly be thinking to yourself, what, what can I do? What can I do to better myself? Yeah, and, you know, Life, situation, society, everything right now, is, it's a little bit on the frustrating negative side. So if I can just push that aside and think, no, no, that's their problem. What can I do? I find that I get excited and I get um, enthusiastic about, you know, oh, I could try this. Right? And, and try, I guess, is my biggest thing, too. I, I worry sometimes we get a little bit of, well, it has, I have to know for sure it's going to work. It's like, 
we'll see if it works. I mean, it's, 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 I don't see any harm in trying. So I well, want like, to famous saying, that. I think is you shoot for the moon. And if, even if you miss, you land among the stars. So let's mm-hmm. shoot for the moon folks. Let's, let's yeah. try. What, what are we going to, what are we going to do this year? Let us we've know what's your whole, goal. We, we got a year to do it. <laughs> That's right. Let us know. Reply, comment below, email us. Let us know what's your yes. goal. What's, is it related to AAC or not? Um, yeah. What do you, what do you want to get out of the remainder of, of the school year and, and into the fall? Um, yeah. Shoot for the Fresh moon. start. Shoot mm-hmm. for the moon. All right. Have a great one. You guys we will catch you next time for innovative AAC solutions. I'm Laura Hayes. And I'm Cheryl Livingston. See you later. Thank you.